Just, just remember those links, tricks, rules, manners, and my suggested feeds. Right, give me the lights on again, so I can go off. <laughs> now, remember the one, how it got to provisions. How do you get from tricks to provisions? You don't have to tell me now. <laughs> if you don't remember, it means you're not interested. The um, providers may be the climate produced by the rules. The tricks, you've seen the link with provisions, but the providers may be the climate produced by the rules and the current manners. So tricks really are an action situation. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> now rules, rules are likely to be out of date um, repair kits for bad provisions, not bad providers, um, and a safety net for enfeebled providers. But it can also be shorthand for advantageous time distortion, which is what the word shorthand is. Because it means that you can write quicker than anyone has ever written, and that's why it's called shorthand, I think. So, in fact, rules are, are nothing more than an ordering situation. Tricks are an action situation, rules are an ordering situation. Now, manners, manners are. They're a reconnaissable product of this interaction between providers and provisions in aiming to miss, not in just the interaction, but in, in doing something, in aiming to miss. And uh, because I know the suspense must be enormous, and a number who already decided not to come next week, I would <coughs> just to, as an aside, as a, as a preview, like upstairs, downstairs preview of next week, that the, the most boisterous systems are the rough ones. The most boisterous systems, the ones which will exist and pay off any system, are the rough ones. If you aim at something with a rough one, you aim to miss. Now, manners, as I said. The next one is that they are, uh, uh, I think, and, and um, I'm not sure about this, but I, th I think that they are tools for humanizing change, not for delaying it, not for distorting it. <coughs> The rules can distort. I think manners are, are humanizing of change. So manners really are a, um, a resolving situation. These, all those three, I am suggesting, are very useful tools as long as we... Um, as long as we define them to our satisfaction, not necessarily to my satisfaction, but to our satisfaction as operators, then they are useful tools in the, in the whole object of the game, which is what I shall talk about next week. Thank you. I get out. Good evening. Sorry, a little bit late. No, I'm not sorry at all. Um, right. Uh, <coughs> who's doing the lights tonight? It's a hard job. <laughs> There's someone we might not choose. <laughs> Let's have those first three slides, which are testing slides, in fact.
Oh yes, yes. yes. It, it, they're testing, but he's not. He's not digging a hole. He's making a pile of earth. Next. Well, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I can do that. And she's she's not naughty. She actually designed the clothes. Um, and that is one which no series of lectures, as far as I'm concerned, we can ever miss. <laughs> it is an alternative to a bridge. Um, it is, in fact, a double, double inflated thing, cottage loaf. How are those sides down there, Marjorie? It must be very, you probably can't see them at all. Yes, you can. Sideways on. Um, <laughs> I'm not interested in that, him. Eh? Ah, that's better. That's far better. I can see them now better. Um, Lovely. It's an uh, alternative to a bridge. It blows itself up um, from the motor in the eight-ton truck, which is trying to get across the river. Uh, the motor is used as an inflation unit. Um, the first bit inflates, lifts up the truck, um, then switches off and lifts up the hover pallet, which is the second thing, and then hovers itself across the river. So it's a bridge. Now, uh, there should be six blanks, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> this little lady, was, uh, I don't know if she's here, this me. She's very assistant. Now, tonight, aiming to miss. Aiming to miss sequence. The blue streak has no significance whatsoever. <laughs> Only just seen it. It wasn't that uh, the ship sequence had anything to do at all with whether the helicopter pilot could land or not. He knew he could land on that ship, so did the photographer, so did the ship. The problem was one of um, not physical maneuvering, but intent as to why he should land. And that was the, the milk order. If he'd, he would have missed that ship if he hadn't have had two pints of milk in the helicopter, even if he'd landed perfectly. Uh, the <coughs> For the very last time, where we are now, products, aiming to miss, and eating. Now, the progress of these talks have, 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 have taken one or two changes. Uh, the words are exactly the same, um, the errors still exist, but the emphasis has altered a little bit. And also it's now got back to my favorite color. This, as you see, is a side elevation of the chart. Um, not a plan, and certainly not a front elevation. Now, the food and cooks have got a bit mixed up together. And the providers and provisions, um, there's a certain, if it's bigger than smaller, then it's more important than it was. <coughs> the object of the, of the exercise, i.e. to be useful, um, has got, has got uh, far thicker, the arrow, it rules through, it picks up enormous amount of strength from tricks, and a certain amount of strength from rules, and the uh, direction it takes, because it's aiming to miss, and you see there are more targets now, it's even more difficult to miss the targets. Um, the, the aim is helped by the manners, but the manners, of course, are fed by the fact that it doesn't hit the targets, because if it hits the targets, then the manners of the game go wrong. Um, cooking is really that, that feedback. Uh, the raw materials have, have become so slovenly that some of you might actually raise the point as to where, in fact, in relation to, to um, architectural endeavor, where, in fact, you define 
the raw materials. Remember in the first talk I suggested that in any case, architects were not providers but merely provisions. So the raw materials get a bit, bit uh, important but rather straggly. But the action starts a little bit earlier than it did previously, if you remember. And the uh, products uh, are, are numerous, but not all that important as the action. And the action right at the end, when you're going through the targets, and of course the arrow somehow runs off the page, should have done, hasn't, is the eating. But the eating, of course, is, is uh, a, again a continuous process, um, as opposed to meals which are a convenience of interval, largely related, I believe, to one's larger and smaller intestine. But nothing at all to do with the need that eating is a, is a continuous process which is awfully important. And I'm suggesting also that architecture is a continuous process which, unless it's important, um, should be put to bed. Now, the, uh, so, so now what I do, we'll have a few, few slides with, with um, little bits about the, um, the incredible, how very difficult it is, that was very short, um, how very difficult it is to, to miss, but how essential it is that you do miss, and, and, and the tools that now and again one tries to employ in order to encourage not only architects to learn how to miss, but to encourage society in general to realize that to travel, hopefully, is better than to arrive. Ah, yes. Yeah. Now, this is on its side, on purpose. <laughs> if that lady is here. Um, we'll, we'll go through these. This really, all, all this is, is a chart for a particular client suggesting how, in fact, we considered through talking to them, they divided up their day in relation to various activities which previously they had asked for rooms for. And, in fact, what it enables one to do is to, s is to see, um, not only oneself, but for anyone else to see how much overlap there is and how much waste there is. So if you can, make, if you can establish calculated waste as, as a design tool, as an early stage, then... Um, <laughs> where's Peter Cook gone? Oh, there he is. <laughs> if you can establish calculated waste, as a design tool at an early stage, then people will be encouraged to say, well, we're not sure whether we e ever meant that anyhow. We're not sure whether we ever used that for that anyhow. But um, this is how we thought you would like it. That is that we are suffering, as I said last week, we are suffering a situation, architects are suffering a situation, where because we've been so indolent or, or boringly methodical, that people feel they have to systemize their, their, their wants and urges before we can understand them. And in this, which is another exercise, I think there's the same client, that's why. <laughs> these are just shadow projections at various times of the year. But what it is doing, and I think there's another one there, what it is doing is over and above reminding them of the, of the little buildings they have in this space. Uh, is doing rather like the first slide did. It's saying, forget that thing might be digging a hole. In fact, it was digging a hole. It wasn't piling up stuff, but doesn't matter. Um, forget that and say, well, it might be piling up. It might not be digging a hole. I.e., that it might not be worrying uh, to be concerned with shadows. It might be constructive to find where you can get useful shadows. Uh, that's our duty to remind people. Because at the moment, for instance, the architectural profession talks about, well, I mean, think of, think of the latest lighting rules. I mean, you can't even use the latest protractor now, if anyone ever did. But I mean, 
You, you, the, the whole point about, about um, lighting is that there was some assumed uh, rule at one time that, that natural lighting was good for you and that, and that to have a reduction in light was bad for you. Um, it meant you couldn't read the small print, presumably. However, there may be a lot of times when people would be a lot happier if they could see each other less. That's when shadows become beneficial. So all the time, um, you, you, you add a new tool by, by um, not, not, <coughs> not ad hocery, not using as a pointer a broken radio aerial, which I'm doing tonight, but through engaging everyone all the time in the uh, reasonable exercise of common sense. The Potter's Think Belt, that particular um, transfer area, the nice thing, and why I've put the slide on, is that having designed a rather sort of neat, tight little system of fold-out railway trucks and, and little capsules on the top and inflatable things, etc., etc., one found that in most instances, the si railway sidings weren't parallel. Um, they were all over the shop. So the um, early rectangular plan on the left then had to accommodate rails such as the plan on, on the right is accommodating. However, all of a sudden you found that you had continuous wedge situations where you didn't have to be too careful about the fold-out condition. Because sure enough, somewhere you would find a space that was even wider than you'd thought was the standard space. So this was clever after the event and found that the ground rules were in fact literally the ground rules were a lot more um, conducive to, to a variation of, of usefulness than had they been regular. I'm not sure whether they shouldn't have let the corner of the John Hancock building sink a little bit more, rather than worrying about that, that particular slide. You see, it might, might have been the only apartment block that you could, you could have angled floors in. This is a... Now, have I... It, it doesn't... I think I may have mentioned this before, but it doesn't matter because it's, it's relevant tonight. It doesn't matter to me. These two slides, that one, that, that's uh, a site down the Thames where, in fact, we were suggesting housing could be put. Peter, have I talked about the two sites on housing in these lectures? Because I'll do a shorthand if I have. Rochdale and, and uh, Muckingford. No? Right. That's Rochdale. That's Muckingford. In Rochdale, there is um, a slum clearance problem. There is a reduction in industry. There is an aging population. There is high unemployment. There is um, an overworked, understaffed police force. There is a network of overstrained and near to, to cracking 19th century drains. Um, and there is a, re a reduced railway service, but faster. That is, the trains are less frequent, but when they run, they are faster. And that's in Rochdale. I mean, you can probably see those experts can see it from the photograph, all those things exist. Um, now, in Muckingford, there is a water table about nine inches down. There are soil conditions which are largely sort of 30 years of bed spreads and other rubbish from the GLC um, <coughs> with, with, with the topsoil on. The police force is called George on a bicycle. <laughs> uh, there are enormous, highly paid job um, opportunities in Canvey Island and the rest around there. Um, the average age is difficult to determine because very few people live there. The um, train service is... Uh, fast and 
um, rather intermittent, much like Rochdale. People living in Rochdale at the moment who want a house say, we know we're going to live here for some years. We might not always want to live here. Indeed, there might be no reason to live here. But we're going to live here for some years anyhow, and we'd like a house. People, the few that are around, in Muckingford, or people in the area who could have a house in Muckingford, say, my word, if there was a house in Muckingford, we would love to live there. But we don't know for how long, because we're on our way. We're moving, but that, at the moment, would be ideal. Both aspirations um, relate to, to a short-term occupancy of housing. The 19th century drains and the nine-inch water table suggest that whatever you do with sewage, you can't put it in a pipe system, whether existing or new. The uh, shortage of policemen in both instances might well suggest that they shouldn't be wasting their time trying to save boys from hitting lampposts with, with uh, air guns, etc. The, or, or, or sort of trying to reduce so-called vandalism, which a lot of nonsense has been written about in papers today, is he? Um, the uh, nature of uh, capacity to rebuild in, in Rochdale is very difficult because the, the first thing, as you know, the building industry is one of the big high bankruptcy things. So if, if an economy, if, a, if an urban economy is in decline, the first people who vanish are the builders. In Muckingford, there's never been a builder. Uh, so there's, there's a shortage in both instances of what one would assume would be the, the, the immediate provider of housing. Now, without laboring that anymore, what I'm suggesting is that for very different reasons, the, the aim of the architect should not be to hit the so-called aspirations of the, of the local authority, but to, to miss all those aspirations and thereby provide a very uniform form of housing which would match both towns. But it isn't what you'd get if you went to Mr. Crossland and asked him, well, uh, can I do houses in Rochdale? He would ask for very different houses in Rochdale as he would from here and would expect a very different procedure. It's unfair to take him personally, I mean, the DOE. Now, the, um, <coughs> the uh, avoidance of targets and, and, and the value of vague similarities is what the, the last slides were about. Um, but the, well, it was the value of vague similarities and the strength of, of charting differences in order to come to the same solution. Now, Th this one is a pun, aiming to miss. Th these, these slides are a pun in so much as there are a series of details for a particular structure where, in fact, in literal terms and in very small sort of little jolly details or structuring things, one, one avoids a problem by aiming to miss. Now, it isn't the same as tolerance, because if you have built-in tolerance, in fact, you are assuming a um, plus and minus factor in your elements. If you aim to miss, you don't bother with tolerance. Now, the aim to miss zone is, is pink, obviously. But the, the top one is a bad one because, in fact, one is back on tolerance because of the connection with the outside skin. It doesn't matter whether you understand what the drawings are or not. The line skin, that, in fact, has gone back to the tolerance situation. And, and because of the link, it is a, it is a worse detail than, than this one, where, in fact, no one is determining where, in fact, one thing ends and one thing starts again. And it isn't being slovenly. It might actually attract better people into the building industry, for a start. <laughs> the, uh, 
the, the, the banking, again, the banking of cabins up against the building is, is an obvious one where um, it isn't worth trying to fit. It's better to aim to miss, but it's, as I say, it's a pun on, on what the rest of the thing is about. And it, it, uh, once again, <coughs> if you stack boxes together, but at some time want to take one box away or change the shape of another, then it's never worth in involving yourself in, in, the, in the box equivalent of plastic theory as far as structure goes. It's never worth um, assuming how one box can aid another. Because if you assume that and you say, well, just look, we're not wasting a penny of your money, a minute of our time, because that is, is spreading to that, what you are wasting is is the opportunity of the client and the user to, to, at some date when you won't be around, to say, Christ, we never wanted that middle box. And they say, oh, you've got to keep it because that braces that, links that, and so See, and that was very neat and economical for you. So it's, it's, it's really encouraging um, slovenliness. Now, it can go wrong. <laughs> this funny little thing was designed for those children in order to exclude their mother, um, who was tall. And therefore, the, the, uh, the pavilion was rather small, and the steps up to the um, deck over the swimming pool were uh, treacherous, unless you behaved like, uh, like children do, which uh, you know how to balance and use your hands and feet. Now, the father was fat, and the mother was tall. So, Together, they never really ventured into the children's domain because it was either dangerous or impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Those children now are both over six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> the bloody thing's still there. But the father, who was fat, was short, and he takes refuge <laughs> there, away from the house. The mother, unfortunately, is dead. <laughs> now you must have seen this this building many times before, particularly back to front, which I said so true. But that that was the chimney I thought was rather good. That is the chimney the client has now added. <laughs> Twenty feet of stainless steel tube with a hood over the top purely because he wanted to alter the, the method of ventilation and the type of fireplace. But in fact, he's now done far cleverer things than I ever thought of. If you look at the corner of the building, which is not very clear, but the corner of the wood, you'll see white vertical bits, which are enormous angle brackets, <coughs> stainless steel angle brackets, from which guy line, guy ropes, go up to the top of the chimney with turnbuckles on. And he can tune his chimney to the winds. <laughs> Um, on the assumption that the roof is stable, which is a little bit loose on his part. <laughs> but I think it's marvellous. Look at that. And you can see it from Mars. I was <laughs> driving. It's, it's about a mile off the road, and, um, but you can see it from the road if you look carefully. You can see the chimney. I'm driving with a, <coughs> a friend, a David Alford, actually, and I said, oh, I marvellous house around here, I did. And he said, oh, that must be it. And all he saw was the chimney. It was the one thing I didn't do, but it's the best bit of the lot. <coughs> now, the, um, we're back on this, this, this same thing. Uh, this, this phased construction, aiming to miss, um, for, for a number of reasons, um, there was a need to phase the construction of this building. Primarily it was economic, but partly it was social um, in determining what they should be doing anyhow. And so the first bit that went up was nothing more and is up now. It's nothing more than a steel structure and a slab and drains, etc., etc. Now, it might not be, um, it might be bigger than they need, that framework. However, it was as much as they were given. So, 
it's impossible now for the local authority or anyone else to say, um, my word, you're not growing as fast as we thought. Um, you don't mind if we take a corner off your site or, or turn the road through here or after all you don't mind a footpath there because you're not using it. You can't. There's this great rusting framework of, of the entire site. So it's rather better than, than, a, than a file of letters of, of empty promises in, in, in the desk of some planning officer. Um, however, the, um, having got the thing there, the, uh, you, you can't continue, you can't have a continuous process of aiming to miss unless you put some validity on the targets that you're missing. You can, you can put an adverse validity, but you must recognize them as targets. And they must be avoided at all costs. If they're worth, worthless targets, you just drive through the middle of them, it wouldn't hurt. So the validity of the target in, in something like this is often a, an assumed belief or an assumed aspiration on the part of the client as to what one day they'd love to do. <coughs> to try and not just be a sort of package dealer, which most architects are. Funnily enough, the real package dealer, I mean the people we call package dealer architects, are far less package dealer than the artists amongst us. With a capital A. I mean, you know, the architect, artists. They're, they're the package dealers because you cannot change that package. And they start, they start feeding you dreams about it from the first day, and, it, and, and the fit is so tight, there's no chance of even taking the wrapping off. Um, this sort of load of rusting thing, uh, we put a fair in because someone, uh, some, nothing to do with the client, but they wanted a fair in the area. Well, there was a nice rusting framework. It was bad time of the year, so the slab might be useful as far as drains go, and they could tie a few tent guy ropes up to the structure, etc., etc. And um, although it was an awful day, as you can see, and the slab doesn't drain quite as well as it might, for it's only the rough tamped one. Um, there was a feeling of enclosure, you know, an identity and security. But what, what was more interesting is that uh, the client said, Christ, yes, you can get quite a big fare in that, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord, yeah. So it's very good, it's very nice if you can um, excite people into growing vines downwards down through an inspection chamber or <laughs> you know, sort of tomatoes in a manhole. Um, worth trying, worth trying. But you have to aim to do that. You can't, it doesn't just play itself. Now, this was a loony thing because having put up the screens for this football match that was being played several hundred miles away, but people still kept in the stands, in the seats. Uh, the season was over, there was no rule. They, they could go and sit on the grass, it wasn't wet or anything. Was it? The pitch had to be relayed. Um, but I think there's something, what is a bit sad here, I think there's something of the tyranny of the system we employed of, uh, that, that, that kept them back. So in fact, it was getting as bad a view of the game as they would have done had they watched it live. Uh, whereas there was an opportunity to get a damn sight better view had they not played the, the, the rule game of, of the enclosure they found themselves in and were, and were happy with. Now, this is the front elevation, of course, of the, of the previous diagram. <coughs> Here, of course, I think it becomes clear as to what we're about. <laughs> the, uh, that, that lovely black line, of course, is actually helical. You couldn't see it on the side elevation. So it's missing targets in other ways. The targets really should be drawn sideways on, but you've got to allow a certain amount of artist's license. But you can see where the thing starts and where it goes off. And the edible zone is the, is the useful zone, is the edible zone for eating as a result of the cooking. Now, in order to avoid those targets with a certain amount of speed, because time is essential in being useful, uh, you do actually get out of the edible zone, the dark grey hatched area, 
And this is probably the zone that we should concern ourselves with most, because that is the area in which, even if we do what I'm suggesting, we may still be useless. And with that in mind, well, I would like to read you a few quotations. So you must keep this in mind, of course. And there. <laughs> now, can we have the lights? I might go back on those slides at some time. That's all right. Now, um, let's talk about the... the uh, <coughs> if we think of the uh, interaction, the shadows, the shadow diagrams, what that was doing was, was showing um, a pattern as required or as assumed required by the client, however well determined. If you only show what you think as a result of discussions um, achieve, and nothing, nothing more than that, then it's unlikely you're, you're doing your job properly. And it's no use architects being trained to produce sophisticated variations of enclosures or indeed three-dimensional systems for institutions which themselves are being questioned, very often self-questioned, as to their very validity. And these institutions are not necessarily old institutions. In fact, some of the younger ones need to be questioned, as indeed preschool playgroups should be. Um, the danger of institutions is, is that uh, there is um, an element of uncharted self-preservation. They can explain it away, but that, that is one of the key dangers, because it's uncharted. It is just, it is just to exist uh, is strong in an institution. And of course, there's an adverse time distortion. That once, once you involve yourself um, in an institution, I'm not talking about the IIBA, because that's a clown gents club, but I mean real institutions, uh, like the voting system or something like that, there is, there is an unhealthy distortion of time in operational usefulness. However, they do have um, advantages, uh, such as, uh, let me think, well, let me quote. I think institutions have advantages uh, in so much as that they order, they automatically order through similarity that there is an ordering through similarity. Now, if you take that, that, that uh, comparison of sites, I'd spend quite a bit of time trying to find similarities in order to miss the, the sort of likely target, which was, a, which was a particular site solution to a particular site, and to try and get a standard one. Now, institutions do order similarities, if you look for them. They also... Um, display, however sort of, in however sort of uh, constipated way, a range of tested operational choices. And um, an example of this is something like the Milk Marketing Board, which I'm not sure what it was set up for, but it's a beauty to, to, to check on. It's far better than the Egg Marketing Board or the Pig Purchasing thing or whatever. Milk Marketing Board is a winner. Now, forget the farmer. Look it up. I, I, not even I have time to describe it tonight, but go through how the milk marketing board is set up. It's, it's available to all of us. It's public knowledge. And it's very interesting to see how they look after, one, the cows, and two, the milk drinkers. Now, the cows and the milk drinkers basically are, um, are the, the individuals. They, they, they didn't choose it. The farmers might have chosen it, but the drinker of milk and the cow didn't choose the milk marketing board. And somehow that particular institution um, has, has, is, is at least aware of the danger of losing the constructive disorder of the individual. And I'm not sure whether we are as aware of that. Of the strength of disorder. Not chaos. So that's a different thing. So, 
the um, process in relation to encouraging, and I'm suggesting that we do encourage various institutions, which won't have capital I's or headquarters, but that we encourage various institutions which safeguard this advantage of disorder, the individual. And we encourage them in such a way so that they are not set up through people being short of time. They're not set up in a panic state. But they're set up before any particular situation occurs. Because the, the panic state is the one that sets up the adverse institutions, whether it's government or, or education or whatever. So to avoid panic, the, the um, aiming, to, aiming to miss situation should be made quite public. Shouldn't be a secret, shouldn't be a secret tool. Should be broadcast. We should, we should let people know just, just what dreadful risks we're taking on their behalf, even before they've actually employed us. Um, two, two possibilities, for instance. I, I personally think that architects should have a continuous dialogue with, with the uh, building labor force, uh, hopefully through the unions, but the unions only account for about 40% on a fine Saturday of the building labor force in this country. It might, might be in some other form, because the unions aren't all that representative, so <coughs> Lewis would deny it, but they're not. But, they, but through the unions, say, <coughs> there should be a continuous discourse. The RIBA will never do this, anything like that, or the AIA. Um, just on materials and processes, that we're thinking about, <coughs> you know, Instacrud, Weetabix blocks, and whatever it is, and the weight of it, and the danger, and the smell, etc., as a continuous process, with nothing in mind, nothing in view. So, in fact, that at the same time that we are, are producing a rather better um, menu list for those who want to become architects, we're also producing a rather more accurate employment contract for those who are thinking of going into the building industry. You know, I'm damned if I didn't spend my life building things out of Weetabix, he said, and became a security corps guard. So you've got to... Now, um, there's another jolly little institution that could be set up, which is one between, say, contractors and, and architects. I thought I'd be a professional tonight, Robert. <laughs> I should have turned up. Um, contractors and architects. Now, there, in fact, the new animal is systems. Actually, it's not materials and techniques. Because, as, as you know, contractors say, well, handle them all. Don't worry. Don't worry. But we, we, could, we could think about systems, you see, of, uh, um, of really not needing the contractor except to see that people didn't take too much off the site or whatever. And that could be a continuous dialogue, again, not related to any great housing surge or particular contract, anything like that. So it would, take, it would take the heat out of it while putting the intensity back, and that is why, in fact, can't architecture, rather than just producing uh, products and assumed sort of beneficial environments, why can't architecture constantly generate good ideas to other people as to what they should spend their life doing? or not doing. So it, it, it becomes again a process and not a product orientated thing and we become provisions for life conditioning and not providers of packages for people who are trying to avoid life or at least circumvent it. And here in fact we come onto a thing, has anyone got a copy of the Times, today's time? Because I haven't seen it but I wanted to know. <coughs> well, Apparently, I was asked to sign a round robin um, in relation to this, I think it's marvelous, this little uh, business of, of Imperial College. No, RCA, that's right. RCA um, planning application for the corner of where? What's the street? No one read the news? What? Queensgate. Queensgate, that's right. And, uh, oh, of course, of course, we have a representative here. Well, now, the <laughs> these, these, uh, these fine people from the, <coughs> from, from, from the RCA, uh, for some reason or other, wanted to pull down a couple of totally sort of worthless, you know, as far as I see, useless buildings on the corner and put up a lovely new building. <laughs> the DOE, I mean, 
I, mean, I don't really mind the sort of the establishment design boutique getting it between the eyes now and again, which they have on this occasion. But the um, the sort of the DOE's directive is rather interesting. The uh, minister overruled his inspector, and the directive letter, the the letter of refusal for demolition, not for redevelopment, refusal of demolition for this listed building, listed what, class two. No, no, no. Three, four, doesn't matter. In dealing with an application for building consent for the demolition of a listed building, the quality of the proposed replacement building is not material. Now, that is now law. That is now policy. Now, I find this very interesting. Um, not all that disturbing, but interesting. Because the role and the power of those who apply for inspect, determine, and approve listing becomes an entirely new game. And it's close to taxidermy, embalming, or stopping clocks. Uh, I see there's a note here saying this could form a basis for a new design course for the Royal College gents. Well, it could, actually. <laughs> But think of the marvellous villainy, because it only takes, it takes less than 10 years, if you have Mark Girard helping you, in establishing some, some sort of worthless cinema or pub or something, um, really has enormous significance um, because of the, the, uh, the, the trode skin covering to the seats or the, the tiles that were used or the fact that there was that extraordinary meeting there, etc. Et and you can build up quite, in ten years, you can get a building listed for almost any reason. Now, people must know this after that directive. It would be a very useful gang of people who could go along to Stamford, Lord Burley's sort of you know, the town that the, law, the barely stopped, the only major growth town in this country that didn't have a railway station and therefore stopped in its, in its form as a wool town basically dependent on road transport. You could go along to people like that, or others like uh, Lord Lever or, or Jack Cohen, and sort of say, well, no, how's your system going at the moment? They say, wow, that's great. They say those. The main thing is that we don't want that town opened up because otherwise they'll never use our hypermarkets. You know, keep Winchester congested. Right, we've the answer for you here. Give us ten years, we'll make sure no one can knock a brick down. <laughs> That's what we want. Now this is design. And, and here is a new design program. Uh, albeit possibly unhealthy, but if turned to, to the way I'm suggesting, i.e. Not, not bothering about the targets here, for God's sake, you really aim to miss on this one. Um, I told you it'd be easier tonight than last week. <laughs> the, um, ah yes, remember the, the danger zones and that end elevation? Financial Times Industrial Architecture Award. Just a few at random, which I've carefully marked. <coughs> Ocrios, oh, sorry, Ocros Distillery, Banffsh. <laughs> <laughs> Consists of ten huge warehouses, two ancillary buildings. Warehouses 300 feet by 100 feet, ancillary buildings 200 feet, 100 feet square, forms a very large complex of buildings. They, they don't leave anything to the imagination, these reports. They, let, they tell you that it's quite large. It has been cited in remote rolling countryside with such tact that its scale is a surprise. <laughs> Though contemporary in essence, Orkroos, accepts local tradition, both in the use of harling, here white, and of sharper than normal roof pitches. Roofs have been manipulated in various other ways to reduce the apparent height of these large buildings. The result is far from pastiche, <laughs> yet recognizably kindred to the area. There was nothing there before. <laughs> Now, this is aiming to hit. <laughs> All of this is aiming to hit. It's the aiming to hit session. 
And I'll tell you the authors of these reports soon. Considerable earth moving has played an important part, and the handling of the interiors is of high quality. This is an excellent example of a problem in architecture which we have to solve the large-scale intruder in need of sensitive handling. So they got a gong. Uh, now, oh, this is a beauty. New Covent Garden Market. Any of you been there? Have any of you been there? The one pub. Have any of you been to New Covent Garden at night? When it works. This distribution center is planned with classical simplicity and directness. <laughs> that was the one thing that you never found in the old Covent Garden. Otherwise, they'd never have made those profits. There you are. <laughs> classical simplicity and directness. The massive scale of traffic and structure of controls, tunnels and roads being logically reduced as the goods are broken down in bulk to the scale of the shop and of handling by humans. <laughs> <laughs> no. No runs of pipes, boxes, or switch panels mar the design. When they are important elements, as in the air-conditioned flower market. Now, why is it important to have air conditioning in a flower market? Primarily because you've got a roof that lets the sun through. <laughs> they are used to enhance the interior. The main market is a bold and self-confident solution to the problem. Oh, thank God we're still solving problems. It's and the detailing is sturdy and sensible throughout, and the external expression of the building is clean and without fuss. The impression was of a quality building realized with a strict budget, only by using maximum design skills. Well, that's nice. You know, I mean, at least they say, well, it doesn't look so, it looks so like you use minimum design skills on this one using maximum design skills, and by complete control of the construction, finishes, and services. Well, that's, that's a great relief from all clients. I think that <laughs> architects at last have some control over the construction. <laughs> and here, here comes the sensitive 4B pencil man. The leftover peripheral areas have been planted and grassed, but do not seem to have awakened any enthusiasm for their maintenance. Now, <laughs> I couldn't garden with flower guys. <laughs> right, I won't go on very more. It's, uh, fine. Oh, yes, this is a nice one. Design de a computer building, Newcastle upon Tyne. Designed deliberately to be deadpan. <laughs> <laughs> this building almost literally disappears. <laughs> it's a single story accompaniment to the adjoining headquarters office which I might add is four stories high and certainly doesn't disappear, so presumably you see it through this building when it's disappeared, you see the, it's a company. It's designed, company in the adjoining headquarters office is linked by a slightly lower building, dark blue brick. On all sides, the exterior consists of full height glass reflecting panels, windows which can be inserted within the inner wall structure are not visible from five meters away. You can see that window from 30 feet. <laughs> Watch it next time. <laughs> Architecture of the building. Oh, I'm not against these buildings. I'm just, it's this claptrap. Architecture of the building is negative. But technically, it is brilliantly simple. It does not stir the pulse, but it does innovate. And then there's milking parlors and... Um, there's another one which said it looks like it could have been carved out of, out of granite, but in fact it was brick and steel. Oh yes, this building is superbly thought out and built. It is detailed in a classical way. Every dimension of proportion is elegantly controlled and detailed as though it were in marble. <laughs> yes, full marks to him. Yes, I, I should get a steel award. As I was saying, it is a simple building, a plain rectangular shed. It was seen when more or less empty, and one wondered as the huge machines moved in whether the white walls and scarlet steelwork may not begin to look a little too elegant by contrast with the heavy work they house. Now, there we are. Now, what you must know, the buildings, as I say, may be admirable. The writers of that, like that, writers of that were Professor Peter Shepherd, Professor Jack Napper, 
and Sir Colin Anderson. Now, if in fact that is what, and this is sent out free by the Financial Times, to, to, not to architects, but to other people to, to be told what, what in fact we are all looking for and where we give our medals, because we have determined there what is important, and that is a great step forward, those buildings. The um, whole point about that, as you realize, was that I do think there's a terrible danger in defining um, hits. <laughs> the uh, situation at the moment that um, interests uh, interests our office, is related to things which could never be a success and certainly could scarcely be a hit. For instance, we ha we're interested in drifting harbors, um, which don't get much sort of support from the docks board at the moment. Um, a floating breakwater, which is a little bit doubtful. A nomad truck park, high security truck park, which tends to deny one, you know, almost a contradiction in terms. It's like a gypsy high security truck park. And, uh, and a walking airport, which is obviously absurd when you can fly. <laughs> uh, however, we labor on, as you are doing, listening to this. And um, I would like to finish up on this because, of course, tonight is the great night of discussion. with two more timeless quotations of what I think our tasks are. And one is to establish how little built product architecture is required and to continuously establish this and continuously test ourselves and how much performance directed architectural thought should be included in continuous social and economic planning. And our second task um, is, is very much one of the moment, and I, I don't think, I hope I won't have to say this in five years' time, <laughs> is to reduce the continental and sovereign and regional and climatic and economic restraints that encourage retention of architecturally, uh, socially exclusive provincialism, which we are really wallowing in at the moment. So, uh, aiming, aiming to miss, requires a robust system. And robust systems survive and improve through showing the real value of intermediate targets by missing them. It's interesting, I don't know, I'm having, having gone through these and a number of you have been patient enough to have sat through all three, I'm, I'm still not certain whether, um, whether lectures are the ideal way of of having this sort of exchange. I, I'm really, I mean, I think this is one of the nicest places to, to talk in, so it's a delight actually to talk here, so that helps. But I wonder whether in fact there is any, any system whereby there can be sort of um, a, a sort of continuous exchange without it being too heavily programmed that doesn't have the event connotation that, that sitting around like this does. I suppose, I suppose that's what, I suppose in, if in fact schools of architecture were, were um, open to all at all times and weren't, weren't just a sort of extrusion process for the, the loony volunteers, you know, who <laughs> think they might get something out of it at the start of their life. Um, but that, that possibly could, could work. I like the sound of these plastic glasses. Is that, are they, is, is that all they are? <laughs> it's going to be a sort of <laughs> Jimmy Durante at the piano act with them. Or are they going to be filled? Well, well, I think I actually like... I don't think anyone's allowed to drink unless they speak.
How very boring. <laughs> very boring. <laughs> Lovely, thanks. There's apparently an interesting dilemma, though I don't think any dilemmas at the RIBA are, are really interesting, but they find it interesting there, um, as, to, as to whether they should <laughs> encourage more or less architects. And uh, they have the sort of immediate sort of groan, um, Christ, there's no work, so sh we should encourage less. And then they have the, you know, the, the big thinkers of 66 Portland Place saying, Ah, no. Extend our tasks, you see. Make us, make us essential elements of almost everything else. Um, and then they have the econ economists there, or the, or the bookkeepers, who say, well, Christ's sake, we, we're broke, and it would be far easier to run a smaller institute. Um, and then they have the regionalists, who say, what we need is a bigger institute, but more fragmented. And we don't really need London. What we, what we need is, is a um, protection racket all through the country. Otherwise, you can't blame us if we do a Poulsen on you. And then, then they have the academics, who, um, to a large extent, the academics at the RIBA, um, and in a way, Jack Knapp has an idea. I mean, it's, it's not libelous. It's probably here tonight. They close quite early, I believe. And, um, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> They, in fact, have, I think, I think are quite dedicated men. They are dedicated to, to the eternal process of producing architects via schools of architecture. And this, they think, is, um, well, dedicated to it. They're, they're absolutely opposed, as you can see. I don't know if anyone here has ever tried to do the RIBA exams externally. But they don't make it easy for you at all. Now, of course, this... Um, maintenance of uh, schools of architecture also has a great deal to do with that period just prior to retirement. Um, it's awfully useful to, to, to move on to a school of architecture. Uh, that's probably putting it at its lowest, sort of saddest form. But I do think that if I was a member of the public and not a sort of rarefied elitist, um, I would be very worried uh, by architects at the present moment um, wanting more protection. I would be very suspect of architects not wanting to be brought up before the Monopolist Commission, which they are, God willing, going to be. Um, I would think that uh, these lot of people are, are failed rainmakers and that they're doing a touch of the sort of, you know, elephant going to the valley where they die. That the, the elephant's trumpet, they only recognize warring elephants when they've lost one tusk and their, their trunk has got elastoplast on. And, and that's when you start being friendly because you're going into that last valley of the dead elephants. <laughs> if this is so, I don't think it takes very long for the... Um, sort of one of the brightest sections of the population, i.e. those under the age of 16, to suss out that it's, 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 it's really is a bit of a dead loss as a job. Um, I think this is happening at the moment. That's all, eh? It's just a thought. <laughs> Seventy-five percent of all building work in the UK is commanded by architects, and only fourteen percent of building work in the United States. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be a very odd statistic. But it, it's by law here, you see. Yes, but I wonder whether an American, an American member of the public, would have the same view that architects in this country, like to presume the British public, have of the appropriate person for providing you with a piece of enclosed environment being an architect. I wonder that in the context mm. of the fact that assuming people in the world to need 
some kind of a roof to be given to them in order that the rain may be kept off. One can look at the uh, UNESCO predicted population figures for the year 2000 and ignoring any wars which might occur. In the meanwhile, observe that it will need one million houses to be built each day between yeah. now and the end of the century. Whether it's really significant that architects should be involved in the production of environments at all, because clearly, even if the RIBA multiplied exponentially, it couldn't deal with that. I don't. I doubt whether. Um I doubt whether architects should be um, involved with housing, although uh, in any way, I doubt whether they should on their, on their track record. I absolutely agree. But I also think that um, there is a danger. It isn't just learning, learning to tell people that it's lovely to have a wet head and you don't need a roof, although there's, you know, rich people do that, don't they? I mean, they walk over the moors and things, and they, they, uh, things that are awfully wet, but they're healthy. But I think that the, um, I don't think a house is any less of a home than a, than a comfortable hotel or, or, or a friendly airship. Um, and that you notice the lack of a house only when, it's, when, when you haven't got it when the need is there. Yeah, but you're defining enclosure as being necessary the whole while and therefore admitting to the need of some mechanism to provide mm. the enclosure. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. The question must be whether any organized body of people determines it is their particular responsibility to provide enclosure as against providing eggs or milk yes. to both to yes. other institutions. Well, I, I think that, well, that, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very good example because what, what is interesting in relation to food is that um, uh, Shell and BP are in it up to their neck as much as, as, much as the farmers are now. And um, I think that the, the assumption that, that uh, shelter is related to environments that we call buildings, rather like the, the thing which, you know that, that bridge, when it, was, when it was inflated the first time, it was a building because it had a truck in it. When it, inflation went on and it hovered across the water, it was a vehicle because it was moving. It was exactly the same structure. And um, I think that the... the uh, you see, some, if you take this country, which, which doesn't, you know, is so, uh, it, it cannot actually even feel the million pound, a uh, million houses a day problem. It hasn't got those, those vibes anymore. It hasn't got even people belly aching at it because it isn't important. So it doesn't even have, you know, warring dervishes who want pemmican um, or whatever. I think that the uh, range of, of the, the whole situation about shelter, that architects, if they're any good, are probably in a good situation, but not for very much longer, to, to uh, spell out methods of, of devolution of, of their power and responsibility. And it's not to do it in, in quite such a sort of quaint um, Mickey Mouse way as, as self-help groups or anything like that. It's not that at all, because they're still making houses. It's, 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 it's a spread over the situation of shelter and, and, and the frequency and the intervals at which it is needed, and, and literally the comparison between a house and, as I've said before, you know, an edible an umbrella that becomes edible when the sun comes out. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, your, your figures are right, and so are these. Uh, because it is, it is immediately a problem in so much it's an economic problem because we don't understand the economics. That, that this, seven, in 1974, 600 million people earn 24 pounds a year or less. Um, and in fact, every year, there are more and more people becoming hungry and poorer on the ratings. So the whole, the whole situation about shelter, I mean, funny enough, at one time, if you take some of the, um, you don't have to go all that far back in history, I mean, take something in this country, which was very, uh, we know all the reasons for it, etc., etc. but the tied cottage system, which was related to by far the largest industry, at the time tied cottages really worked, there were, there were four times as many people working in agriculture as any other industry, and I think the second industry, in fact, was, was uh, shipping and trading or something. It certainly wasn't mining or anything like that. 
that the tide cottage then actually took shelter out of the economic argument. It was, it was, it was the jacket on your back. It was the agreement for employment, the house. The house was, a, a, the house was like the, the shears or the scythe you were given, etc., etc. It, it was a service, it was a process. It wasn't, it wasn't a bribe and it wasn't a, um, a costed item because people didn't work on the farm unless they, they had shelter, full stop. Now, perhaps, I mean, just as possibly one, one makes food more and more indigestible to people with bad teeth, you encourage people to go to the dentist or at least have decent false teeth. But, the, you know, you might do that in the shelter equation. So it becomes, it becomes inevitable that the service is there and is therefore not costed. But then possibly not paid for in the context that people need to earn a living off it by designing it. Yes, 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 probably, yes, reality. exactly. But there aren't many people inventing fresh water anymore. But there were a lot of people who used to make a lot of money out of, out of divining. Oh, what was it called? What's it? Dazzles. What? Dazzles. What's it called? Dazzles. Dazzles, yeah. You know, no one's come up, no one's, there's, there's no money to be made saying, here, I've got an even better water for you in Manchester and that North Wales rubbish. <laughs> I think so, and I think this, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, the funny contradiction, I think, which is that if you put the tiny cottage model, you have a model that doesn't have the outside economy, thought of in terms of um, present units of measurement and profit and all that yeah. stuff. If you put the other model, which is the edible um, umbrella up to the something like mm. there is in the other model this uh, petrol kind of uh, consumer paradigm. And I think that you know there is this strange contradiction in the argument actually in your argument really, and also in the climate in general about which is the right way out. The one of um, Moving out of the whole area and into a kind of, uh, well, the Martin Pollock thing, you know, garbage housing, into a kind of uh, transient, sort of transient solution. Or whether it's that we go to Earth. I mean, I really think this is a, you know, if I'm really talking about the kind of population that's without a war at some point in the future, I was talking about uh, scarcer and scarcer resources. Then this question of what is the right strategy in terms of what we do with objects, and in which context we do it. It's a really, really serious question. Yes, I, think I think the model seems to me to be exposed. Well, I, I think it is, I mean, in, in, you know, you use the word objects. I think if, if, if uh, shelter is seen as the increasing provision of particular objects, rather than, than the increasing availability of a particular surface, a service that stops you getting wet, because it hurts you or whatever, then then you're right. There is there is a confusion. But the no one, I mean, not, no critics of the of uh, persons like myself. I'm still convinced that I mean, I still have a great deal of interest and affection in in uh, in in waste and scrapping and and you know consumer destroyable products. But the the, the key ones have never been objected to which are, in fact, food. Um, there's a certain interest in recycling, but there's, and yet the food industry is, is an extremely, um, it, it doesn't get strictures from the government, it's an ex I mean, not many. Um, it's extremely boisterous industry, a robust system, um, and is, is dedicated to, to waste. Um, and, and to continuity of provision. But these large figures of twenty-four dollars a year, that that points to an entirely other situation where there is no food industry on that scale, where people are, are you know can't hardly survive. You see, it's no, but it doesn't list dead people. Up these two, you, 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 you give very large figures which refer to the third world, you know, or very low figures in terms of annual income. That, you know, but you don't also realise that those people are, you know, they don't have the food situation that we have. 
where you don't have this consumption of food either. But perhaps they related to, um, to the outside the economic system in relation to their food. Uh, probably <coughs> well, they, they don't necessarily buy food. Buy food? They practically die from starvation. Yeah, but food. the food that they get, they get for subsistence. Hmm? But I mean, it's not my information on some parts of the world that they have hmm. subsistence at all. They just barely make it. I mean, I think that's so, I, this is an area of confusion. Well, I don't see. I don't see why it's the area of confusion. I think it Can might be an area of, of guilt on our part no, that we're not concerning ourselves with the with the, with, the, with the real problem. Not necessarily, but, but, I, but also can become our reality at some point. Yes, but yes, I agree. It might, but what, what, it, But I think that all one does with, a, with a, I mean, I, I I nod and agree, but it's very gloomy. Not necessarily, um, because you can choose to play differently. I mean, I, I think... Yes, but we can't choose to play it differently if we're concerned about... Hmm? I think the umbrella is the cross novel in relation to shelter. The edible umbrella? Yes. On the other hand, I think one could use other go. technique, but then with other technique come social changes because they have to be socially acceptable. We either have to do the propaganda or we have to change the system or something. I mean, try putting people under, you know, I don't know what... No, no. So, well, I see what you, I see. No, 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 no. I see what you mean. But uh, what I was what I was trying to say uh, tonight was that if, in fact, we start um, playing in a ball game that we, we we didn't make the rules for, and we don't really know how you lose. But um, for instance, uh, I do, I don't think that one should try and make things more socially acceptable or change the system in quite such. I mean, it's quite such a bland way as I think you were suggesting. I think, in fact, coming back to um, the earlier point, that if you, if you redefine the provision of shelter in, in, such, in such terms that get all right akin to the edible umbrella, then there is no particular system to change or, or no, no battle to fight because there is no structure that can sieve that through and oppose it. This is one of the targets you miss. If you if you try if you really th you know think that that uh, um <coughs> it isn't political suicide for either party to solve what they jokingly call the housing problem in this country, then I disagree with you. I think it is political suicide, and that is why it comes up year after year, and they all have targets and they never hit them, and anyhow there's no evidence at all that the target has got anything to do with shelter. So I think that possibly one, I, one I doesn't agree. change a system but which is... I think statistically all the time, which is like very abstract. Mm. I mean, like it's formulated in a very abstract way. So many houses, you know, we make it, but it's extremely abstract. It's what does that guarantee you? I mean, they formulate it in a very abstract way. Well, the, the I, think, oh, I, think, I mean, sometimes they formulate in a very detailed way. For instance, the Egg Marketing Board this year is no longer, this year for the first time in 15 years, this Christmas, is no longer, because people don't eat eggs in, in the cold weather, apparently. Not so many. Or eggs aren't consumed so many. Though. So there was always a guaranteed price for eggs in the cold winter, and they were powdered put into the great powdered egg mountain in the sky or wherever. And uh, this year they've said, no, rot it. You organize your chickens better. We're not, we're not guaranteeing you a market. Now, that was, that was, that was establishment. That was, that was statistically uh, determined. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't theoretical. It's, it's actually happening. Now, it might be that um, rather like the, the um, apple forests, the, what are they called? Apple forests. Orchards. Um, the apple forests in Kent. These orchards in Kent. Um, they have always been very light on their toes, the, the apple growers of Kent. And they literally wait for particular... Um, demands or, or lack of demands at the beginning of each season. And they, 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 they take them all out in the first few months of the year. If they don't get anything from the government about guaranteed prices for apples or demands for showerings for scrumpy or whatever, 
it's out. They've cleared out. And uh, the, the Kent, um, these, the whole Kent farming situation is that the most profitable orchard is not on absolutely the best soil for apple trees. It's on the median soil that grows pretty good apple trees, but is marvelous for other things. Um, and and uh, the, the, the well-heated, insulated bus shelter on the bus route where the buses never turn up might be very good in relation to the housing problem. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. That, that it's it's uh, it, it's 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 spreading spreading the system without 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 a sort of time wasting punch up against an institution which really is only too pleased to divest itself of its responsibilities. I mean, I, I'm sure the DOE doesn't want anything to do with housing. I'm sure, I wish it would go away. So if you're aiming to this, how do you know that you haven't just moved the target? For example, there's a big, I went to Irvine, California, to a yeah. university, and there was this enormous university that I'd been told was virtually uh, given freely by the owners of the land, and it was some big ranch family that owned an enormous area of California, and they gave away this university they encouraged, uh, that was to encourage people to come and, and live around the university. And land was very, very cheap. And it was only discovered fairly late in the operation that what was really happening, there was that the Irvine family or trustees were really selling water. And so it looked as though they're aiming to miss, but really they're right on target. They're right on target. Yeah. An admirable group. I mean, they they they, they deserve the Financial Times award. <laughs> um, I, I I think in our, the, the only way uh, is is this business of observation in time. That's why I did the side and the front elevation. That that as you're approaching targets, you're also you're also going round them, and that, that as as you pass them, you can still observe. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's very tricky. I think that's one of the skills. You know, I think it's one of the skills because um, I'm not actually opposed to the Irvine family selling water. Um, I think that, that possibly where we, at, at architecture or whoever was involved, be, be more shrewd about aiming to miss, they might have hinted to the Irvine family a rather less sort of <laughs> time wasting rather than building a university in order to, to get the community. Um, because the, the whole thing about water, I mean the nice thing about water at the moment is that, is that well in this country, presumably in the States, it's still reasonably cheap and that, that all you really pay for is moving it. So it's, it's rather, it's, in fact it's more static a product than, than powdered eggs. Therefore, there is a locational problem in, 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 in the value of water. You know, they, they've reached it at the moment on present acceptable things about having more than the four-inch bath, etc., in, in, the, in the route from North Wales to Manchester. They're not doing that second valley because that bit of money would be just too, much, too high for Manchester's water rates. So... Uh, I'm thinking round that very sly question <laughs> as fast as I can. Uh, well, the of being on target, because the Irvines were on target. It's only an illusion that they were on target. They were on target. But the problem, but, I mean, their target was very simple compared to some of the targets in the They just wanted to make money on selling what? Oh yes, I mean that 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 target. I didn't. I, that that is a target which which one should avoid. But the point that Richard was making that in in apparently um, encouraging the growth, one was was encouraging other people to hit a, hit a target straight on. And uh, this is. I mean, no, the no, they didn't. Moved. Only the Irving family won on that one. No, they didn't. No, they finally got water, they got something, they got... Well, they got a university! I mean, that's like a hole in the head. I mean... <laughs> 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 it's, not, it's not the same thing as the target, it's the moving. It's not the same thing.
No, I don't. I, I was only saying that there is an opportunity. Is if you if you if you move if you move craftily enough, you can you can observe the target from both sides. I didn't say the targets move. They don't. The, tar the targets. All the all the targets do is 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 um, suffer from from decrepitude. As I say, piss off. Oh, pass up. <laughs> Well, I'm going to read this. Dear Mr. Blank, Ray, Environment Department, I'm surprised that St. Martin's School can seriously contemplate having... Oh, this is the Department of Chemistry at the University of Leicester. I'm surprised that St. Martin's School can seriously contemplate having an environmental department within the school. Environmental problems are almost always complex and often multidisciplinary problems. And I doubt that any course given by an art school alone could possibly be adequate preparation for any useful job. A course which included elements of pure and applied science and economics as well as art training would surely be more valid and more valuable. Please tell me what possible jobs you think students might take if they simply have art training. <laughs> and as the person who's passed it up has said, this is a true example of aiming to hit. <laughs> Wonderful timing. I think that the, uh, back to the Irving family, they're the only people who won on that. Yeah, they are. They find the target stays where it is. Yeah, the target stays where it is. And therefore, I was saying that, that, that uh, I think, I, the point is that I think in, in, in what we're involved with, most targets are, are quite easy to find and quite easy to, to suss out. Uh, that was a very clever one. But it never happened again. <laughs> I mean, not in that area. Ah, uh, oh, well, I mean, it happens with cats. The Walt Disney family set up uh, the School of Visual Arts in California. They built an enormous complex, art complex. Mm. Uh, I visited that at the same time as I went to Irving, or Irvine, as they say. And it uh, was a very ambiguous kind of building, rather extraordinary. You weren't sure whether you were visiting NASA or, or an art school. And they pumped an enormous amount of money into this enterprise. And it seemed very suspicious. They built a, a theatre. The, the dean, or the, the man that ran the thing, was a, a stage designer, a producer. They built a theatre to his specification where every square metre or I suppose they used feet and inches over there, it was raised on jacks. You could move the whole, the, the whole auditorium up and down in small segments at will with push-button controls. Before anything was ever produced in the theater, they fired him. So nobody could ever use that thing because it was built to a very precise specification for one person's idea about theater. They weren't a bit worried. I'm sure that, uh, and that was, the school has uh, fallen into disuse practically. But, there, there, but that, that isn't an easy one, that isn't a difficult one to suss out. Yeah, then, then you realize that they built, that they knew that the school wasn't technically feasible and that it could be taken over by NASA and that NASA would find a use for all these up and down yeah. uh, <laughs> elevations. Uh, you became aware that, that the target was not to make the, the, the biggest and greatest art school in the world but for them to produce a piece of real estate. Real estate for NASA. And in an, in an area, which <laughs> that calculation. Was another area, <laughs> <laughs> that's Walt Disney owned all the land around. Mm. And people had to, to buy the plots of land around because they would be in... Uh, yeah. Well, this is exactly on. the same. I mean, the, the, you know, the unwritten story of the, of the National Trade Center at Birmingham has got nothing to do with trade shows at all. Um, it's, it's, it's a group of, of, uh, of primarily of hoteliers and also the council wanting a bit more return. This is in short term. Hoteliers and the council wanting more return on their, on their airport than they get since Manchester and, and Speak as uh, Liverpool one has grown. But, but the long term aim is, is an enormous 
is an enormous transit warehouse for breaking down large loads between North America and Europe, and, and not as a national exhibition centre at all. But I mean, th those things, I mean, those are usually reasonably clear. Why well, not reasonably clear? I think there's clear. something a little ambiguous about the position of aiming to miss, because you know that you're not aiming at the target. Therefore, your aim is somewhere other than the target. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so that the target is the new thing that you're aiming at. You're missing the target. Yes, I mean, if you try and, if you try and, if you try and, if you try and fire in a, in a, in a fairground between ducks moving along like that, then you're, you're far less interested in the size of the ducks as you are in the speed of them. But you're still watching the target, though you're aiming to miss. So you're, you're, you, you concern yourself with the speed of your Irvins or your, or your National Trade Center or whatever, or, or Disneyland thing, in order to, in fact, give, give some sort of generation to what you do. But your, your skill at aiming and your capacity to pull the trigger at the right time is, is, is unimpaired. In fact, should be improved. Because if, if you look at the size of ducks, you decide where they tip over. So if, you, if in fact, your, your time sequence is blown, because you know there will be another duck along, and you know just get it below the, di uh, below the neck. Do you know, there's a funny figure ground problem in the, in, the, in the argument, because it presupposes that the, that the ground, or the, or the rhetoric of the argument, presupposes that the ground may necessarily be the... the, the the releasing converse of the target. I mean, I just thought of an, um, an argument by Max Planck, which was there are no unanswerable questions, there are only found formulated, formulated questions. So when it sort of mm -hmm. posits this relationship between the question and the answer. But there's something more automatic about your rhetoric, you know, which involves, like the one with the ducks, for example, and then we go in where a duck isn't. But how does one know, you know necessarily that that I mean, it's, it's an interesting period of technique, but doesn't necessarily is it, is it a well-formulated question? Is it necessarily a well-formulated question? So I was suggesting it was, actually, but I was suggesting, <laughs> <laughs> as I spent three weeks suggesting it yeah, was, yeah. But, 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 but that... Uh, what you can say that the aim is to make money, or the target is to make money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs> yes, you could, you could. <laughs> I mean, you could. <laughs> what do you do about the um, St. Louis Gas and Electric Company, who in 1967 started handing out free uh, lamps and light bulbs? Uh, to their consumers, um, and who later got hit by antitrust laws. Um, it seems that they're sort of catching both ways and being caught both ways. Well, the Detroit Edison, when I was asked in Detroit in '68, was st we still got free light bulbs um, for any fitting, as long as you brought in an old, useless Detroit Edison bulb. And um, what they did actually is that they were over, well, they weren't overprinted, they were in different wrappers, and they had on the wrapper the phrase, no commercial value. <coughs> Indeed, they hadn't had any commercial value because you couldn't buy a light bulb in a wrapper that said no commercial value on for any money. Though you could buy identical light bulbs in other wrappers which said 20 cents <laughs> or whatever for it. And um, they, as far as I know, they still do that. Now, I personally think that that, that was an admirable service. Um, I mean, it would be dangerous if Philips and people started selling, you know, aerials that always fall off radios, such as that, that thing. Um, but I, I think that the... I mean, just as, just as no one costs false teeth and no one asks in the National Health Service a widow to wear her husband's teeth, Though, though um, pound sterling for you know pound weight teeth are far more expensive, false teeth far more expensive than a house. 
but uh, that particular equation doesn't come in, and the, and the replacement is seen as 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 again as a, as an inevitable process. The um, I mean, I I would have thought that, that that it would it would pay the National Coal Board to supply domestic users with coal free. Um, they can't come under the Monopolist Commission in this country because they've got the monopoly. You know, I mean, the Monopolist Commission is, is written about those, those, <laughs> those late slags, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who, who didn't move in early enough on. So, uh, I, d I think that um, if, if those other people are caught by the Monopolist Commission, you know, or the trust laws, um, just as Kodak quite rightly were in the States, that you can't, you know, you, in the States you can no longer buy a film with, with the processing price included, but next to the film are envelopes worth a cent, which you pay an awful lot for, which is the envelope that you send the film back in and they process it. Um, I, I think that, that to encourage a particular sequence without any, any sort of um, chance of competition is not admirable, but in many instances may be, may be extremely viable. Yeah. Cedric, uh, what's your game with us? I mean, the thing that's been fascinating me, this series, <laughs> having heard you 43 times in a number of strange places, is the, is the structuralism really? of it. That you'd be very insistent, for instance, in your use of that diagram, its repetition, the insistence upon our understanding of the loops, the feedback yeah. loops. Yeah. Um, and I then one starts to think of us as these ducks moving that have no necessary substance. Also, um, very consistent audience, pretty much 80% of the people have come before. And you probably <coughs> guessed that, or it's maybe it's a mm. successful series. Um, and I'm fascinated <laughs> by what, you know, as, as Alvin would say if he were here, sort of, what's your game? You know, because um, it's the most structured lecture, even any one of them, is, is more structured than you usually do, less dependent on anecdote, more yeah. dependent on the structure of the thing, the repetition of the diagram, even the false diagram, that, you know, the use of something, of, of, of a device, whether it's a diagram or a sequence, and the gaps and all the rest of it, and then throwing one off course. And my, my interpretation, probably quite wrong, um, but one thing that worries me is that I think it's an audience that may still nevertheless expect, in, in the sort of puritanical sense, to have a message, even if, the, and perhaps, and am I wrong, would, would misunderstand your message as always miss, because that could be just as disastrous as aiming to hit, in my view because it would immediately you know, get into a, a certain kind of coyness, a certain kind of over-cleverness, whereas my suspicion is what I like about the things that you do is that you're prepared to play it straight sometimes. I mean, a lot of that, you know, like the, the, the nice example um, that you gave, I think, last chat, the one of the, the doorway to the Blackpool Zoo oh, yeah. uh, restaurant, was that it was playing playing it so straight it almost hurt, you know, and it was playing it straight, overlaid on straight, overlaid on straight. And then the next, in the next breath, you can say, but, but here we need you. And I, to me, that's the essence of the whole thing, and I'm desperately concerned, but I might be wrong, that um, we're waiting for the message which says, don't aim to hit, aim to miss. Okay, we've got the new message, now we can all... Uh, and that, that would be missing it also. Also, I like your idea yes. of the, yeah. the speed of the duck, but not necessarily its size. Mm. Can you? But the other thing, again, another <laughs> Alvin, another I, 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 the well-laid table. I mean, what you've given us the last three weeks is absolutely the, the well-laid table with the peas in the right corner of the TV dinner, <laughs> um, which isn't, is certainly aiming to do some, something, you know and a reminder of where the peace were. Yeah. Well, what, That's what's right. been your goal? <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 it's a superb account of what, what has been going on. Um, I, 
it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of, little bit of self-indulgent in that I wanted a discussion such as this in so much as um, I don't, I don't, I don't clip myself. I mean, it's very easy to do <laughs> blackboard doors and things. I don't normally put myself in a situation where I get three sly questions in a row from Richard Hamilton. The last one being the, the toughest of the lot. Um, so there's a certain amount of self-indulgence in, in there. I also think that if anyone thinks, as you said, rather better than I could put it, that it's either or, then they've got the message wrong again. And the point of this series of lectures has been to, um, as, as have some past ones, have been to, in my view, to overstate the obvious, which I think is, is, is neglected. Uh, therefore, I am, I am intellectually uh, slovenly and, 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 and sort of emotionally uh, uh, thoughtless about those lovely targets, one of, whom, one of which now and again might be worth hitting, because I, I think that the emphasis is on hitting them. So primarily it's been, it's been a suggestion of shift, but you can only make a suggestion of shift in rooms full of sharks like this, if, if, you, if you spell it out uh, reasonably clearly and sequentially, and you do get the peas in the right corner of the tray. <laughs> now, um, the, the uh, usefulness of, of what I've said, I mean, uh, personally, I've actually described how I, how I go about design and test myself, even if I'm still hitting targets by mistake. Uh, there was a big bit, anyone, well, at least one person here knows, there was a big, uh, big bit of being clever after the event uh, on tonight, and that was this business of, of shadows. Um, but in fact, those shadow drawings were prepared with, with extraordinary honesty and accuracy, which seldom go together. And um, to, to really show them that, that, it, that it wasn't too bad, you know, that, there was, that the place wasn't too overcast. And it was really in retrospect, going back to the exhi exhibition, it was really a sort of ABC D type drawing where one started not, not making the best of a dog's dinner, but reminding oneself that, that there, are, there are assets in deprivation because the terms of deprivation are invariably um, one side of the coin. So I think that that um, is something... I mean, the, the, you're right, there's nothing left to chance. Those three apparently jokey and consequential slides at the start are <laughs> very, very key um, to the situation. Only so much as I find, I find lectures, I mean, I find listening, listening to yourself and others very valuable in sharpening up one's own um, uh, you, can't, you can't say shut me up your own tool, can you? Can you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, 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 this comes back to the first, first point, collapse of start party. Um, comes back to the first point in the discussion. But I am constantly interested in what the value is of such lectures. So I actually give them in a certain level of puzzlement. I mean, I sit and listen to the, <coughs> the five from New York and I know exactly why they're giving their lectures. And I don't think it's worth the thought. Not I know those particularly, but I mean, I don't think... No, no, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I think there are some lectures aren't worth giving. It would be better to have them well printed or, or tapes and, and get them under plain cover at breakfast time. Um, and, and therefore, the, there's, there is, is that part, Peter, which I can't answer to your question as to what the game is. I only know that, that the particular game is that I have a, I have a very sort of rapidly reached um, saturation point as far as how many lectures I can give in one year. And it's running at something like 10 at the moment, and that's probably too many. But I, they, they, are, they are very critical design tools for me 
Um, however, I, I hope that <laughs> they've, got, they've got some use to others, but only... There was, is that clown who was... Is a fellow from um, Canterbury? Yeah. Ah. I was down in Canterbury this morning, and he'd been to the other two, you see, and he, he sort of said, well, I, I went out feeling cheated, and then I thought, my God, you put your finger on this and made it clear. And the two things he thought I put my finger on had not occurred to me. <laughs> um, so it was very valuable that he'd been to those lectures, and to him as well. I mean, I didn't tell it. That's why I checked whether he was here. I'm not going to tell him I hadn't thought of that. But I, 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 I certainly think there is a skill and, and, and a, a skill and a design method. I mean, all right, perhaps I overemphasize it, but I certainly think there is, there is a, a large field of skill and design method in aiming to miss which isn't touched at the moment and should be. That's why I did the, the, the sort of horror comic Walt Disney suggestion for a new course for the RCA, just as a result of that one ruling from the minister. So I, 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 I think that, that, you know, at various times, things occur to me which I, I think are worth <laughs> passing over. I think it's very nice the way you pass around complimentary wine. That was very, that, that's, that's good timing. And a nice touch. Nice meaning accurate. <laughs> I mean, I didn't taste it myself. So. Hint. <laughs> <laughs> Is that answer anywhere near answer, do you think? I mean, some things you can't answer, really. I mean, some of your questions you can't answer. <laughs> We don't need an answer. Everyone's entitled to answer a qu ask a question, but you, people aren't automatically <laughs> required to answer them. <laughs> Do you think it's a valuable use of your space? How huh? about that for a question? <laughs> what I like about the use of the space is that the lectern is a, is a Last speaker and the uh, drawings behind your head, which have been there for the same <coughs> three weeks, uh, probably couldn't be more alien mm. to what you're about. And it's nice that, that neither point is mentioned. You know, the nasty stain on the side of the last speaker is covered up by reproductions of your head, which one can see. <laughs> and you don't mention the drawings mm. that are seen probably when the old person sort of got used to what you look and like. Cannot I see the and yeah. cannot see the slides yeah. anyhow. I like that. That's yes. the only comment yeah. about the use of the Yeah. <laughs> I think that's good. But that, 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 you see, now, that is back to our 600 million who are hungry. That is, is very valuable smearing of the, of the image. You know, that's, that really is peanut butter, jam and bottle. Um, which, uh, you know, and with bread underneath, which is, is, is valuable to make because it wouldn't be any, it would be of no advantage to anyone else if we excluded the peanut butter and only kept the other three. But we must take, we must take, it, 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 it's, it's not really a, a sort of Talleyrand thing of taking advantage of decadence, but, you know, that, that we must, we must really, uh, um, capitalize on our riches. And one of our riches at the moment is that we still have time to make mistakes. And that ain't going to last all that long. And if we make mistakes privately, we're being selfish, mean, and in fact are, are, are you know, burning coal in the room next to the one we're sitting in. I came into the lectures and it wasn't the most amusing lectures that I've ever been to. I've gone through W.C. Fields to Robert Benchley. <laughs> and it's been fascinating. Well, well that's I, lovely. I see a very precise objective in all that you've done. I think you've been aiming at a very precise uh, philosophy. And when you show the joint uh, analysis that you put up on the screen, and then listed the advantages of all this, Thing, as though they were coincidental. But obviously, those advantages were the objective, the target. They weren't something that just happened because you were aiming to miss. You were aiming at those objectives and you arrived at this 
uh, loose assemblage of mm. elements. So I'm, I, I'm suspicious that you're done over. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, ah, it does presume that I can recognize other people's targets. Yes. Yeah. I think you enjoy that reputation, actually, refuting other people's targets. And I think that's one of the reasons why food is something that upsets you. Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> because food's one of the few things about which everybody's an expert. And so it's one of the few commodities which has become considered within the terms of a sort of general conceptual framework that informs society at large. So people are interested in what food does to you. And the food industry has been very quick to jump on that and inform people further about mm. what food yeah. does to you. Yeah. And exploit that. Um, we then, you have sort of nostalgia for, it seemed to me, for um, the way in which food and uh, feeding is treated in a uh, in less developed societies, in, if you like, societies which don't yet have the luxury of a functionalist view of, of um, the various commodities, but are doomed still to sort of ontological view of it, where they're still obsessed with what food is rather than what it does for them. And I sense a sort of resentment on your part that um, we don't have that view here, which would allow you to mock um, our attitudes to food, its waste, its consumption, <coughs> the talent with which you managed to castigate architecture. Um, did you I, yeah, I think there's that? a bit of that. I don't think I'm quite as uh, contemptuous of our attitude to food as I am I am jealous of the of the sort of almost subliminal methodology whereby we're we're <laughs> we're fed it. You know what I mean? That I, I think that, that that there's a there's a that it is an extraordinary it's an extraordinary cool operation um, that the 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 little pimples are at both ends of the scale, one is the, the absurdity of actually having to go to hospital through swallowing a plastic spacecraft in your cornflakes. And, 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 and the other is um, the recent uh, outrage from these chicken farmers who have now been told that, 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 that when we collectively are not going to buy their blasted eggs and powder them down, um, in saying that um, if we'd known that, we would have got hens which taste better when slaughtered and, and lay less eggs, you know, we'd have covered ourselves both ways. Now, those, those are only the humps in a system that, that operates um, both publicly and privately, both, both central government and, and capitalism. Where's the black from those cars which were sold at 20 years? Yeah, yes. Um, you see, and, and, and therefore I, I'm in admiration of that particular system and feel, which I may be wrong, may be wrong on this, because I wasn't nostalgic about the, the, the third world and they're realizing that food, food is, you know, to be eaten rather than what it's about. Um, it was that I, I felt that architects either, as, as you said earlier, either make quite clear that they are no longer in a particular game, that they've left They've let it run too long, and it requires rather more rigorous and, and more um, sub-level systeming for provision in relation to shelter. Or they, they actually improve their skills in aiming to miss <laughs> and do the thing. So I, I, I think that uh, the, I mean, the long grain thing, I don't know if you can spend 30 minutes on the Ford, Ford Foundation long grain experiment, which is very interesting. Because having, having, having introduced it, you know, it wasn't only three crops a year, it was also each crop was rather better. So that your same tractor, the same cutting capacity, or whatever they cut things off with. You're good at words, you remembered orchard. What are they? they cut the <laughs> grain. And um, that, that actually the same thing and the same load was that much more valuable. And um, th this is why maybe best to, to um, not worry about um, actually flying Concords and in fact save a certain amount of money on the engines 
and allow people to live in them. Um, but go on building them so people can afford to live in them. I, I think that... Mm. I can think of two large firms, triple barrel names of partners in the States who remain nameless, who in fact are automatically brought into industrial work um, almost at, at the stage when a company is thinking of expanding, i.e. even before it's thought of building a building, which doesn't happen here. because I, I, I left it out of the first two. I'm sorry. No, I know. That's why I gave you that answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, but it, it's, it's true, nevertheless. It's true, nevertheless. And I, I found, oh, you must have noticed, I, I, I faltered a bit. I, I find it a bit difficult to talk about architects and planners and the RIBA in, in quite the same Fame. But on the other hand, there are a number here, and uh, so it was. And that—that's another. You see, that—that's another business of blurring, blurring the image in order to, in order to, for people to like sort of. What's that stuff when they did it with eggs and poster paint? Chiaroscuro or something. Yeah. Tempera. Ah, temper. He's given up. Feeling it nice. <laughs> but you know what I mean. That it was. It, there was parish pump brought in. You're quite right. And. Um, I think it's a bit cheap, <laughs> a bit cheap trick, but because it isn't cheap actually. If you don't bring it in, then they say, "Oh, that they." I, I, I don't mean. I mean, then one says to oneself, "Well, that's all very well, but he, he doesn't realise what we're up against tomorrow." You see, and what you're up against tomorrow is too late anyhow. If you've got. To <laughs>